Welcome back. In this lecture, we look at characteristics and functions of square matrices that will be useful to us in our study of linear regression. Here's an outline of what we'll be looking at in this lecture. We'll first look at several characteristics of square matrices. We'll define what it means for a square matrix to be positive definite, positive semi-definite, and non-negative. We'll also define the inverse of a square matrix and give conditions under which the inverse of the square matrix exists. We'll then look at two important functions of square matrices, the trace of a matrix and the determinant. Next, we'll specify conditions that a covariance matrix must satisfy. We'll then look at conditions on the covariance matrix that must be satisfied in order for the PDF of a multivariate normal distribution to exist. Next, we'll define characteristic roots and characteristic vectors of a square matrix. And then finally, we'll show how to use characteristic roots and characteristic vectors to determine properties of square matrices. So let's get into it. So again, we'll first look at characteristics of square matrices. So let's first define what it means for a matrix to be positive definite. So let cap sig be a p by p matrix. So it is p by p. It has the same number of rows as columns, p rows and p columns. And so it is a square matrix. Then cap sig is said to be positive definite, if and only if the quadratic form given by x prime times cap sig times x is greater than zero, strictly greater than zero, for all p by one non-zero vectors x. In other words, for all p by one x vectors that are not equal to the zero vector, where zero subscript p by, uh, by one is the p by one vector containing all zeros. Next, let's define what it means for a square matrix to be positive semi-definite. So again, let cap sig be a square matrix of dimension p, so it's p by p. Then cap sig is said to be positive semi-definite if and only if the quadratic form given by x prime times cap sig times x is greater than or equal to 0. So here the inequality is uh, non-strict. For all x not equal to the zero vector and the quadratic form x prime times cap sig times x is equal to zero for at least one of those x vectors. So if that's the case then the p by p matrix cap sig is said to be positive semi-definite. And then finally let's define non-negative matrices. So again let cap sig be a p by p square matrix. Then cap sig is said to be non-negative if and only if it is either positive definite or positive semi-definite. Next, let's define what uh, the inverse of a square matrix is. So let bold A be a p by p matrix. And so again, this is a square matrix. Suppose that there exists a p by p matrix, which will denote, for now at least, by bold B, such that B times A is equal to the p by p identity matrix, and A times B is equal to the p by p identity matrix as well. Now you'll recall that an identity matrix has ones down the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So if such a p by p matrix B exists, then the matrix B is called the inverse of the matrix A. Now, when the inverse of, of A exists, we denote it using the notation shown here. A with a negative one up in the uh, superscript, okay, so to uh, indicate inverse. And so using that notation, 
then we would know that that matrix uh, A inverse <coughs> is such that A inverse times A and A times A inverse both are equal to the P by P identity matrix. Now, a matrix possessing an inverse is said to be non-singular. Now, when will the inverse of a square matrix exist? So let's look at these requirements. Let A be a P by P matrix. In order for the inverse of A to exist, the, the matrix A must be positive definite. Now we define what it means for a matrix, a square matrix, to be positive definite a few slides ago. And so a, a square matrix A has to be positive definite in order for the inverse of that matrix to exist. Now let's look at two important functions of a square matrix. So the two important functions that we're going to be talking about now and utilizing throughout the course are the trace and the determinant of a matrix. The trace of a matrix is, of a square matrix in particular, is defined on the following slide, and we'll look at that in just a moment. The definition of the determinant of a square matrix is a bit more complicated to describe, and so instead of uh, giving the uh, formal mathematical definition of the determinant of a square matrix here, what we're going to do is wait until we have some additional firepower, some additional uh, results that we're going to look at in a few moments to provide a formula for calculating the determinant. So we have a definition formula, uh, a method of calculating the determinant of a square matrix that uh, is provided uh, by a definition, but again, it's, it's a fairly uh, cumbersome, fairly comp complicated, uh, it's cumbersome to describe uh, as well as complicated to cal calculate. Excuse me. But with a few more results that we're going to look at, uh, we're going to have a nice uh, formula that we can use to calculate uh, the determinant of a square matrix. And so we'll, we'll just hold off on uh, talking about how to calculate that determinant until we have those additional results. So let's define the trace of a square matrix and see how to calculate that. So let's let cap sigma be a P by P matrix. The trace of cap sigma, which we will denote by TR as an abbreviation of trace of cap sigma, is defined to be the sum of the diagonal elements of cap sigma. Now denoting the IJ entry of cap sigma by lowercase sigma sub IJ, the trace of cap sigma is given by the following. So it's the sum of the diagonal elements. Now note that the diagonal element in the ith row is denoted by sigma sub i i because the diagonal elements are such that the row index and the column index are the same. And so the trace of the square matrix cap sigma would be sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 and so forth out to sigma sub p p. All right, next, let's look at requirements for a matrix to be a valid covariance matrix. In order for a matrix, cap sigma, to be a valid covariance matrix, it must satisfy the following conditions. The first is that cap sigma must be a square matrix. The second condition is that sigma must be symmetric. And then finally, cap sigma must be a non-negative matrix. It must be either positive definite or positive semi-definite. Now let's take these concepts and look at requirements for a multivariate normal distribution to have a PDF. So recall from a previous lecture video that the PDF, the probability density function of the multivariate normal distribution of rank P, 
with mean vector mu sub x and covariance matrix cap sig sub x has the following form. Now, the thing I want to point out here is that uh, the multivariate normal distribution uh, has a PDF uh, that, it, that incorporates or includes the inverse of the covariance matrix, as you see here. With this representation, the uh, inverse of the covariance matrix shows up in two spots. And so this implies that in order for this PDF to exist, the covariance matrix cap sig sub x must be non-singular. That is, it must possess an inverse. If the inverse does not exist, then the PDF does not exist either. And so the inverse of the covariance matrix will exist if and only if the covariance matrix cap sig sub x is positive definite. And so the PDF of the multivariate normal distribution of rank P will exist if and only if the covariance matrix is positive definite. Now, is it possible for a multivariate normal distribution to have a covariance matrix that is not positive definite, but rather is positive semi-definite? And the answer is yes. A multivariate normal distribution can possess a covariance matrix that is only positive semi-definite rather than positive definite. However, in that case, the covariance matrix will not possess an inverse. And because it does not possess an inverse, the PDF for that particular multivariate normal distribution uh, will not exist. A multivariate normal distribution that does not possess a PDF is said to be degenerate. So a multivariate normal distribution will have a PDF if and only if the covariance matrix is positive definite. If the multivariate normal distribution has a covariance matrix that is positive semi-definite, then it is a degenerate multivariate normal because its PDF does not exist. Okay, next we're going to define characteristic roots and characteristic vectors of a square matrix. And so let cap sig be a P by P matrix. Suppose there exists a P by one non-zero vector, which we'll denote by bold A, and a real number lambda. So lambda is a scalar quantity. It's not a vector or a matrix. All right, and it's, it's a real number such that the following equation holds. So cap sigma times the vector A is equal to lambda times the vector A. So if such a vector A and a real number lambda exist, for which that equality holds, then the real number lambda is called a characteristic root of cap sig, and the vector A is called a characteristic vector of cap sig, corresponding to the characteristic root lambda. Now note <coughs> that the equality cap sig times a equal to lambda times a holds if and only if uh, cap sig times a minus lambda a is equal to the zero vector. And in turn, that's going to hold if and only if cap, the quantity cap sig times a minus lambda times the identity matrix, that quantity times uh, the vector a, if that's equal to the zero vector. Now, it can be shown that a non-zero vector a exists that solve this equation if and only if the determinant of cap sig times a minus lambda times the appropriately sized identity matrix is equal to zero. Now this uh, equation involving the determinant, it's called a determinantal equation, this is called the characteristic equation of the P by P matrix cap sig. Now the determinant of the quantity or the uh, <coughs> difference cap sig times a minus lambda times i, the identity matrix, 
is of the following form. It's the sum, i going from 0 up to p, of <clears throat> c sub i times lambda raised to the p minus i, which when expanded out, uh, that's equal to lambda times p, plus c1 times lambda raised to the p minus 1 power, plus, and so on, out to uh, lambda 1, lambda to the first power, plus uh, c sub p. And in this uh, expression for the summation, c sub 0 is 1. Now, that is a polynomial of degree p in lambda. OK, so this determinantal equation, the determinant of cap sig times a minus lambda times the identity being equal to that polynomial of degree p in lambda is called the characteristic polynomial of the p by p square matrix cap sig. Now, with that, the characteristic equation of cap sig is therefore of the following form. So it's this polynomial uh, expression set equal to 0, lambda to the p, plus c1 times lambda raised to the p minus 1, plus, and so on, out to lambda to the first power, plus c sub p equal to 0. So that is the form of the characteristic equation of the p by p square matrix cap sigma. Now the solutions of this equation, which are the roots of the characteristic polynomial, those are the characteristic roots of cap sig. Now note the following. <clears throat> Here we've got some other terminology uh, that, is, that are commonly used for characteristic roots and characteristic vectors. So characteristic roots are also called characteristic values. And they're also uh, called, and more commonly so, eigenvalues, eigen being uh, German for characteristic. And with that, uh, characteristic vectors are also called eigenvectors. So uh, very often, and perhaps uh, more common than uh, the, uh, the perhaps the most commonly used terminology uh, for characteristic roots and characteristic vectors would be eigenvalues and eigenvectors. All right, now let's use characteristic roots and characteristic vectors to determine properties of square matrices. Okay, so now we're looking at square symmetric matrices. Suppose that cap sig is a p by p symmetric matrix with characteristic roots lambda 1 which is greater than or equal to lambda 2 which is greater than or equal to lambda 3 and so forth out to lambda sub p. So we are uh, letting lambda 1 be the largest uh, characteristic root lambda 2 being the next largest and so forth out to lambda sub p which is the smallest characteristic root. And then for each k from 1 up to p, let bold a sub k denote a length 1 characteristic vector of the matrix cap sigma corresponding to the kth characteristic root of cap sigma. So here the lambdas are characteristic roots and the a sub k's are the corresponding uh, our, our corresponding characteristic vectors of cap sig. Now with that, the results on the following slides hold. So the first result is that the characteristic roots of cap sigma are real numbers as opposed to imaginary numbers or complex numbers. The second result is that characteristic vectors of cap sigma corresponding to different characteristic roots are orthogonal. They are perpendicular. In other words, the inner product of two characteristic vectors that correspond to different characteristic roots, that inner product is equal to zero. And the inner product mathematically is uh, represented this way, as you can see here on the slide, the far hand, uh, the, the left side of the, uh, of the equation. So the transpose 
of a sub i times a sub j. When we carry that calculation out, that's the sum, k going from 1 to p, of the entries in a sub i times the corresponding entries in a sub j. And that sum is equal to 0, as long as i and j are different. And what that means is that we're looking at uh, characteristic vectors corresponding to different characteristic roots. The third result is that the trace of the uh, matrix cap sig is equal to the sum of its characteristic roots. So the trace of cap sig is equal to lambda 1 times lambda 2 plus and so forth out to lambda sub p. Now next, and this is uh, the really important result that we have here. You'll remember that uh, when we were talking about two important functions of a square matrix, um, we define the trace and we mention the determinant. The determinant uh, has a definition that when you try, to, in, in terms of a description, it's fairly uh, cumbersome uh, to uh, describe and uh, uh, just as cumbersome to uh, actually calculate. But here we have a very, very, very helpful result. So again, uh, the context here is when we have uh, a square symmetric matrix. That's the, uh, those are the conditions under which these various results hold. And so in this situation, the determinant of cap sig, which again is a square symmetric matrix, is equal to the product of its characteristic roots. So the determinant of cap sigma is equal to lambda 1 times lambda 2 times and so forth out to times lambda p. So that's very, very easy to calculate. It's much, much easier to calculate the determinant of a uh, square symmetric matrix uh, using this approach, as long as we do have the characteristic roots, then it would be to try to apply uh, the definition uh, to calculate that determinant. All right, the fifth result tells us that the matrix cap sigma is positive definite if and only if all of its characteristic roots are positive. And so that makes it very easy to determine uh, whether or not a square symmetric matrix is positive definite. It's much easier than trying to apply the definition to make that determination. All we have to do is uh, determine uh, somehow using software or a calculator uh, what the uh, characteristic roots are for that matrix and then check to see whether they're all positive. And then the sixth result <coughs> tells us that the matrix cap sigma is positive semi-definite if and only if all of its characteristic roots are non-negative and at least one of them is exactly equal to zero. So if that's the case, then cap sigma is not positive definite, it would be positive, I'm sorry, positive semi-definite. So that's the end of this lecture video. We will continue on in the next video.